Steiner himself suggested there would be an incarnation like there had been of Lucifer, like there had been of Christ. And it's Araman's turn around about now. So, who is Araman? As commenters on several of my other videos have said, Araman is the Persian name for Satan. The lord of the underworld, the master of materialism, that force that denies anything beyond the material reality and draws other beings into a total orientation around that world view. So we see this a lot in the modern approach to science, the mainstream approach to science, which starts with the notion that nothing is real until it's been proven to be real, which is the opposite of how it's worked traditionally, where inspired individuals notice an, a phenomena and then go about attempting to prove it through the scientific method. Right? With this aromanic impulses, aromanic approach, there tends to be a collapse into our lower impulses because partly if there's nothing beyond the material world, what's the point in not doing just what makes us feel good? There's clearly a, a, a short termism in that. Because eating cake all day might feel good, but in five years might not feel good. And that plays into Araman's desire, really, because he wants us to be weak, but not too weak. Because he needs us around so that there's people to control, so that we can be dependent. So if he can weaken us through food, water, air, the materials we're surrounded by, the pharmaceuticals we take to damage our bodies, to degrade us to the point where we can't think for ourselves and assert ourselves to create ourselves as unique individuals, then Araman has some perfect slaves. Araman is the system, the deep state, the centralizing power and force that wants everything to be underneath a single point of control, which is himself. Steiner himself suggested there would be an incarnation like there had been of Lucifer, like there had been of Christ. And it's Araman's turn around about now. Now, there's certainly an increase in materialism, at least from what I can tell, maybe you have a different perspective on that. But who is he if he's here now? And so anything that runs in conflict with that impulse is the enemy to Araman. So Christianity, the true Christian impulse, as Rudolf Steiner would describe it, is that relationship with the divine, with a personal relationship with Christ, with God, which no one can share. Now, that is distinct from the Aramanic version of Christianity, which you could call churchianity, where it's all about the people, the place, the dogmatic rules which you should follow, whether you understand them or not. That's not the Christian impulse that enables us to become unique individuals and contribute to the expansion of consciousness. Also, also masculinity. Now, that is the impulse that drives out, that changes, that shapes that does not accept stagnation, shakes things up, it challenges. Now I work with men. I help them to create a vision for their lives and then forge a path toward that vision, getting their life in order as they move. But there are so many obstacles to us doing that these days. It's not wokeism, it's not feminism. There are elements of those movements that are influenced heavily by Araman, but it is Araman that is influencing them. That is what we're, we're facing against. Masculinity is not the only thing under attack. Femininity also, both in men and women, it's all under attack. To weaken us, to confuse us, to have us asking for guidance from not God, because there's nothing beyond the material world. So what's the highest thing we can look for? Well, government, um, corporations and whatnot. The masculine impulse is an assertion against that. It creates individuality, uniqueness in the world. So masculinity must go. Men must become weak and passive. So it's for us to stand up and not accept that and to forge forward and to create different systems and to support different systems and to be unique as possible, as unique as possible. But where else can you see the Aramanic influence? Even in religious groups, I know a lot of Buddhists who say things like, well, by definition, there is nothing beyond the, mater the material world, or if there is a soul, where is it? Now, I don't throw Buddhism out at all, because as even Steiner says, it's a necessary step in the evolution of Earth's religious consciousness, spiritual evolution. 
So we needed Buddhism. We still need Buddhism to help us create the frame to understand Christianity. Absolutely. Yet there are large portions of those communities that deny the reality of there being anything beyond the material world, which I think is a huge mistake. But not just if you're looking around at how people are practicing today, you can see it also in our mythology. Now, I've always loved, since I was a teenager, J.R.R. Tolkien's work. I found it to be deeply compelling. And only recently have I realized that he was influenced by Steiner also. If you are interested in fairy tales, as Steiner suggests, you should be for your own personal development. And if you have any stake in the history and the future of Anglo-Saxon civilization, then I heavily recommend you go and check out Tolkien's work. The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion in particular, and lots of other chapters of the history of Middle Earth that his son has compiled, but those three books in particular. Now, what Tolkien did was, looking around at his own culture in Britain that has been occupied by so many people over so many millennia, there are, there are a lot of different mythologies and fairy tales that influence our culture. He wanted to create something uniquely British by consolidating all of those stories into one. And I'd say he's done a very good job of that with my current understanding of the of, of mythology. So go and check it out. It was an extensive, extensive work. He created languages. He created concepts. He created whole races and histories and family lineages. It's amazing. It's amazing. Anyway, you can see the Aramanic influence most prominently in Tolkien's work in the character of Gollum. Now, Gollum was once upon a time known as Smeagol, one of the river folk, which if you have any uh, understanding of, or if you've seen the films or read the books, were hobbit-like creatures. Small, but similar to us in, in that they were humanoids. They stood upright and they were very simple folk. They indulged in day-to-day -day activities. So most of the folk in the world just want to get on with their life and not worry about too much. They ate, they drank, they had fun. Now, once one day, Smeagol and his friend were out fishing, having a nice time. Um, one of them fell in, was dragged under by a fish, and he discovered the ring of power. This metal object that had in it all of the malice and the hatred of the Dark Lord Sauron poured into it. He brought it up to the surface to show Smeagol, and he, they were both entirely enamored with it. It seemed to whisper to them this piece of metal, this tool, technology perhaps. It seemed to whisper to them that all of their desires, all of their needs could be fulfilled just by obtaining this thing. It was so compelling that Smeagol killed his best friend in order to obtain it calling it his precious, hunching over it like this, like this, his entire world was focused on this object in front of him that he wanted to curl up around. It was his center of gravity. Now, the changes in Gollum from that point in the story were profound. It was a tragic tale of corruption where he retreated from human society entirely, went to live in a cave, and his body changed from a humanoid figure like you and I to more of a sclerotic, hunched, amphibian, scaly animal. He became known as Gollum because of the <coughs> noise that he made. This defunctional, awful sound, guttural sound. He went into the cave which is deeper into the material world. So we should pay attention to that because I think that Gollum as the character gives us a really good representation of where we move toward when we are in alignment with this aromatic impulse. So go and check out the story of Gollum. So other people are talking about weather. Araman is here. Steiner himself suggested there would be an incarnation like there had been of Lucifer, like there had been of Christ. And it's Araman's turn around about now. Now, there's certainly an increase in materialism, at least from what I can tell. Maybe you have a different perspective on that. But who is he if he's here now? Some people think that maybe he's Elon Musk. 
Now, of course, Elon Musk is a master of technology. He's at the forefront. He's at the leading edge of many of the, the major areas of humanity's technological advancement right now. He's in space. He's in biotech. He's in electric cars. He's in many, many things, many, many areas. AI, obviously. Yet he's also popular with those who are not in favor of centralizing power, which you would expect Iron Man would be in favor of. Perhaps his popularity in multiple domains is just laying the groundwork for him to step into power. Steiner says that Iron Man would be very popular, that he would be presenting the solutions to world hunger he would create a situation where there would be no war. He would unify the world. Now, the ex-Russian prime minister, whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce right now, predicted that Elon Musk would step into becoming the president of the United States this year in 2023, <laughs> following uh, a U.S. civil war. Now, if the West has been, will continue to be, the, the place where Araman is most active, and it seems like it has been over the last thousand years plus, if that starts to fragment, weaken, creating opportunity for new power to step in, are there many other people that have the resources and the intelligence and the connections to bring the West back to prominence, to shine a light on a, a, a hopeful future when everything is broken? Now, I don't want to accuse Elon Musk of being a Nazi because I don't believe it's that simple, but the, the Nazis did that. Post-war, post-World War I, Nazi Ger Germany was totally destroyed. Their economy was smashed. And the Nazis rolled in and said, we're going to do all these amazing things and we can do it. And look, we've already done this, which was a lie. But it was believed. People got behind it. And all the worst, tragic, most tragic things in the last hundred years happened. That sounds like the sort of situation that Iron Man would very much like. Now, Elon Musk doesn't seem to me to be on the surface of it, that kind of guy, but power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely, perhaps. So we'll see. But another alternative, a guy who I really like, not that I have anything to, any problem with Elon Musk, but Jordan Peterson, he's recently proposed the ARC think tank as a competitor to the, to the WEF, uh, which if successful could see a large scale conformity are in a set of collectivist principles now that perhaps is not what he's aiming for but that could very well happen and this is clearly a dangerous thing collectivism itself is a very dangerous thing and just what Araman wants so could it be that peterson being widely loved and obviously a lot of people don't like him as well as musk but widely loved not as well resourced but not poor either could be playing into this somewhat and what can we do with this personally right now to assess the level of aromatic influence in our lives? Well, we've talked about it a little bit with Gollum already. Are you hunched over right now? If you're a, an avid technology watcher, if you spend a lot of time on YouTube, if you're interested in gaming or programming or just surfing the internet, then you spend a lot of time like this probably, hunched, neck extended as if you you can't get yourself close enough to the screen, spine bent. Many of us have damaged ourselves, not irreversibly, but profoundly in that way. So straighten your spine right now. That is all I have to say today. I hope you find that useful and interesting. I'd love to hear your comments. I have one question for you, for anybody who is a Tolkien nerd like myself. Does the fact that Sauron's ring influence Gollum in an aromatic way mean that Sauron is a representation in the story of Araman. And if so, what can we learn about Araman through understanding Tolkien's work? Love to hear your comments below. Let's see them.